Welcome to today's webinar, Understanding and Preventing Suicide with Dr. Lisa Firestone. I'm Gina Carvalho, the Director of Communications for the Glendon Association and for Psych Alive. Glendon's mission is to save lives and enhance mental health by addressing the social problems of suicide, violence, child abuse, and troubled interpersonal relationships. Please visit us on our website at glendon.org and at psychalive.org to learn more about our work. I have a few announcements before we begin the webinar. If you have trouble with the audio on the computer, you can go to the top right hand of your screen and click the Use Telephone, then follow the instructions to listen to the presentation through your phone. You can type questions throughout the webinar on the right hand of your screen. And time permitting, Dr. Firestone will answer questions throughout the webinar. But you can also send any questions to me at Gina, J-I-N-A, at glendon.org, and I will forward them to Dr. Firestone. And now I would like to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Lisa Firestone. She is the Director of Research and Education for the Glendon Association and the Senior Editor at Psych Alive. Dr. Firestone is the co-author of several books, and most recently, The Self Under Siege, a Therapeutic Model for Differentiation, published by Routledge Books, as well as Conquer Your Critical Inner Voice and Creating a Life of Meaning and Compassion. But Dr. Firestone is a regular blogger on psychology today and the Huffington Post. She is also a clinical psychologist in private practice and a consultant on high-risk clients. You can learn more about Dr. Firestone's work at the Glendon Association and on Psych Alive. Enjoy today's webinar, and here's Dr. Firestone. Hello, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, we're going to start this webinar, uh, Understanding and Preventing Suicide. Um, there's myself, and those are our two websites. So if you'd like more information, um, as well as being able to email Gina to ask uh, me questions, feel free to contact us at the Glennon Association or at Psych Alive. The Glennon Association website is our website that has information for professionals and our website Psych Alive has a lot of good information for the general public on psychology and in particular um, on the subject we're talking about today, suicide prevention. So let me just start with some facts about suicide. According to the World Health Organization, every 40 seconds a life is lost to suicide, which means that each year we lose over a million people worldwide to suicide. So suicide is a very huge problem. For every one person who dies by suicide, 20 more attempt to end their lives. So completed suicide or dying by suicide is just kind of the tip of the iceberg of the problem that we're going to be talking about today, with many more people attempting to take their lives. And there's probably also a whole other uh, number of deaths that seem like accidents that are really suicides that don't get counted. And world worldwide, more people die by suicide than all homicides and wars combined. In other words, as human beings, we're more in danger from ourselves than we are from other people. Isn't that an amazing statistic and really a surprising one when you think about it? This is true in our country as well, in the United States. Where I live, there are more people dying by suicide um, by about two-thirds than homicides every year. Another idea is, another statistic is that each person who dies by suicide leaves by, behind an average of five closely impacted survivors, loved ones, family members. But we know that when a young person in a high school dies by suicide, it not only affects their family and friends the most, but it also affects every other person in that school. All of the other students, the other families, all of the other staff, teachers, it has a huge impact. So suicide has a huge impact on all of us. And when I travel and t uh, let anybody know what it is that I do, everybody has a suicide story. Almost everybody has been impacted in one way or another by a loss of somebody they knew or cared about to suicide. Um, and according to the 2009 statistics from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health uh, branch of the United States government, 8.4 million adults in the US had serious thoughts of committing suicide in the past year. So this is in uh, the general public. These are not a clinical population, but just in the general public, 8.4 million adults say that they've thought about suicide in the last year. And 13.4% of people 
who died by suicide had experienced job and financial problems. And that was in the year 2008. We're now just starting to get uh, data for the year 2010. Overall, when we try to look at suicide rates in this country in particular, um, there are some difficulties because the uh, data is not well counted and not up to date because our national death reporting system is underfunded. In 2012, more members of the U.S. military died by suicide than were killed in combat in Afghanistan, with an average of one soldier, active duty soldier, dying of suicide each day. It's 12 to 18 of our veterans that are dying every day to suicide. So this is a huge problem for our military as well, and one that's going to be an ongoing problem because this is the statistic for the active duty, but what we know is that with vets, it's a much higher rate. So we're going to be having this problem ongoing for a very long time. Um, when we look at suicidal thoughts and behavior, this comes from the same SAMHSA study that I mentioned earlier, what we see is that the majority of thoughts about suicide are in the young, 18 to 25 year olds, in, also in terms of making plans and also in terms of making attempts. By far, the most suicide attempts are made by young people, but we lose a lot of elderly people to suicide. Um, we look at the difference between males and females here in this study, and again, this is a general population. The blue bars are females here, the pink bars are males, I'm not sure why they did it this way, but more women have serious thoughts about suicide, more women made suicide plans, and more women attempt suicide. So while more men lose their lives to suicide, more women attempt suicide. And when you add substance abuse into the picture, what we see is that the rates of having had serious thoughts about suicide go way up, same with plans, and same with suicide attempts. And be, by far, the most dangerous drug when it comes to suicide is alcohol. An increased use of alcohol is a real risk factor for suicide. And long-term having alcohol problems accounts for a quarter of all suicides in the United States and is the number two leading psychiatric disorder associated with suicide is alcohol dependence and alcohol addiction. Also, 50% of suicides occur where the person had alcohol in their system. So alcohol is just a drug that interacts with our brain chemistry in such a way that it makes us more impulsively aggressive, potentially toward ourselves or towards other people. So it is the high-risk drug when it comes to suicide. So again, here's this pyramid. What we see is that the tip of the iceberg is how many people we're losing to suicide. And I just saw a very recent statistic, a 2010 a uh, statistic that looks like we're having 38,000 suicides in the year 2010. So they've gone up from this 35,000 number in the year 2008. And what we seem to see is that there's an increase going on with the financial crises uh, that is currently impacting our country. And in the European countries more impacted by this financial crisis, we see higher rates of suicide, particularly those without a safety net. Okay, but. Dying by suicide is kind of just the tip of this iceberg. Then we have the hospitalizations that occur due to suicidal behavior, and then um, the emergency department visits because of self-destructive or suicidal behavior. So what we see is that this is a much bigger problem when we look at the whole range of suicidal behaviors. Now we're going to open our first poll. And I suggest that if you're watching this as a group, you designate one person the poll answerer so that you'll be able to get your answer in before we close the poll. And I want to ask, how many of you have been impacted by uh, somebody you know attempting suicide or you've actually lost somebody to suicide? I'm going to open that poll um, and give you a minute to answer. What I find most often when I go to give talks whether they're to public audiences or professional audiences, that most people have been impacted in one way or another by suicidal behavior of somebody they care about. OK, now with most of the vote in, over 80%, I'm going to close the poll and share it with you. And what I, uh, you answered is that 76% of you said yes, that you had been impacted directly by a suicide attempt or loss of somebody you cared about to suicide, and 24% said no. So again, this is fairly representative of what I find. Um, and you know, I think this is an issue that impacts all of us in one way or another. 
So we've been talking kind of about the statistics and the outside picture of what goes on in terms of suicide. But now I'd like to share with you more of an inside approach. What's going on in the mind of somebody who's suicidal? And I'd like to share with you our approach. And when I say our approach, I mean that of myself and my father, Dr. Robert Firestone, also a clinical psychologist. And there's four premises to our approach. The first is that each person is basically divided. Now, I don't just mean people who are suicidal. I mean all of us, that there's part of us that wants to live, that's goal-directed, that's life-affirming. And we would call this your real self. But on the other hand, there's a part of us that's self-critical, that's self-hating. At its ultimate end, can be self-destructive. Now, the nature and degree of this division is going to vary for each individual. And it's going to depend a lot on our early life experience. But we would call this negative part of ourselves our anti-self. And again, we're talking about this occurring in each individual. Second premise in our approach to suicide is that negative thoughts that people have toward themselves exist on a continuum, from mild self-critical thoughts that we all have at one time or another, to extreme self-hate, all the way up to thoughts about suicide. These are thoughts like, you don't deserve anything. You should just be by yourself. You're a creep. You need to have a drink so you can relax. You should just kill yourself. So again, a whole continuum of self-destructive thoughts that people experience. The third premise to our approach is the self-destructive behavior that people engage in also exists on a continuum. From everything from just being self-denying and limiting our lives to engaging in substance abuse, which is not immediately life-threatening but can truncate or shorten our life, to actual suicide. So this is a whole continuum, again, from self-denial, we include things like isolation, and isolation is a key factor in suicide risk, hating yourself, substance abuse, risk-taking behavior, and actual suicide. And lastly, the fourth premise to our approach is that there's a relationship between these two continuums, that how a person is thinking about themselves is very predictive of how they're likely to behave. So there's events that happen to all of us that are painful, that are, can be negative throughout our life. But then there's how we think about those events the filter that we see our lives through that then influences how we feel about the event and how we're likely to behave. So a lot of times people will say things like, um, he lost his job, so he killed himself. Well, it's not just this one event. It's this filter of these negative thoughts that how a person sees themselves that make that event amplified, which then create extreme negative feelings and then a likelihood to engage in self-destructive behavior. And the extreme negative feelings and the ones that go along with suicide are desperation, psychological pain, hopelessness, helplessness, and desperation. Those feed those negative thoughts. If I'm feeling this bad, these thoughts must be true. And if these thoughts must be true, then my feelings even increase more. And it becomes part of a rotating cycle. But if we can get a hold of these thoughts, what we found in our research is you can do a lot to predict who's at risk, and if you can change the way the person's thinking or the filter through which they're seeing the world, you can do a lot to prevent suicide. So let me just define the thoughts that we're talking about. We call these negative thoughts the critical inner voice, and by that we mean a well-integrated pattern of destructive thoughts about ourselves and about other people. The quotes voices that make up this internalized dialogue are at the root of much of our maladaptive behavior, including, I would contend, self-destructive and suicidal behavior. This internal enemy fosters inwardness, distrust, self-criticism, self-denial, addictions, and a retreat from goal-directed activities. The critical inner voice affects every aspect of our lives, our self-esteem and confidence, our personal and intimate relationships, our performance and accomplishments at school and at work, and again, most particularly, our self-destructive behavior. So I'm going to answer the second poll, uh, or launch the second poll, and ask you how many of you have had thoughts that are self-critical, like the ones we've just talked about. And again, I'm going to give you a few minutes to answer. And what we found in our research, and again, in our research with clinical populations, but also uh, with the general population, is that a lot of people have self-critical thoughts. And actually, the one we found that was the most common is that I'm, you're different from other people. And not different in some unique, specially good way, but in some negative way. Nobody feels like they're part of the in-group in one way or the other, um, which is really interesting. Um, so I'm going to give you just a minute more to answer these. 
and then when we get most of the vote in, um, I will share the response with you. Okay. So with about three quarters of the vote in, um, I'm going to share with you this poll. 36% of you said that you had the negative thought, you're so stupid, you'll never get anything right. 68% said you're different from other people, and again, that's the one we found to be most common. And 46% said you're so unattractive. So again, these are very common negative thoughts. One of the most interesting things we found when we do adult education classes and we have people pair up and say some of their negative thoughts out loud to each other is people are always really surprised that this random other person in the class has very similar negative thoughts to themselves. So there's a real universality um, to some of the negative ways we think about ourselves. And most of us have this to one degree or another. Again, where it's going to get more serious in terms of self-destructive behavior is when these thoughts get further down the continuum and are much more negative or self-destructive. So whoops, here's the negative thoughts that you just endorsed. Um, I'm going to play you a brief clip um, from a video where that we've made uh, for educating people about suicide, where you're going to see three individuals who made very lethal suicide attempts talk about the thoughts they had just prior um, to their suicide attempt. And I think these give you a really good glimpse into the mind of a person who's suicidal. Um, and you know, they're the kind of thing that we don't usually get to see. And I'm going to put my microphone up to the video now. You'll always be alone. The only thing you can do is, is go and kill yourself. I start to think things like, if you don't matter, what does matter? Nothing matters. What are you waking up for? You know you hate waking up every morning. Why bother? It's so, it's so agonizing to wake up in the morning. Why bother doing it? End it. Just end it. I'm out of the Gundry Bridge. Still begging myself not to jump, but hearing the voices saying you must die, and now saying, Jump now, jump now. It was so clear, it was crystal clear, that it wouldn't go away. You've already blown it with this, with this class. Now you've got to kill yourself. You know, you can't, you can't fail this. I remember saying that to myself, that, you know, once, I bought, once, you, once, once you buy the gun, you can't go back. So finally, I, um, I went back through the whole thing and the safety on, the safety off, the safety on, the safety off, my head, my mouth, my chest, my gut, and as I had it to my gut and was pressing on the um, trigger, it went off. You should do this. This is something you should do. I mean, it, sometimes it's, it, I remember it's, it's being rational like that. This is really something you should do. You thought about it long enough. You decided you're going to do it. Now do it. Now quit, quit fooling around and just get it over with. Go ahead. Quit fooling around already. And now you've got these pills. Go ahead. And start taking them. At this point, it was abundantly clear. You must die. You must die. I walked back and forth across the span. Finally, I found a spot, hey, this is it. This is the place I'm going to end my life. Nobody cares. It's time to go. I turned, walked back toward the railing next to the roadway on the bridge, next to the traffic. I ran, and I shoved myself, only using my arms, over the bridge. So as you can see, and, and um, when you get the PowerPoint of this whole presentation, you'll be able to watch um, all these films as, at clips at your leisure as well. Um, but as you can see, these are three individuals are talking about what was going on for them just prior to them take, attempting to take their lives. And one thing I think is interesting to pay attention to is when uh, Trish, the blonde woman, says, and then it went off. They're in a disconnected, dissociated state at the time when they make an attempt. And that's one commonality um, that we find in suicide. Now, there's a couple questions that have come in um, while we were showing the film. One is about what are the statistics uh, in teenagers and what are the red flags? What we saw with teenagers is that there was a rise in their suicide rates that was, went on for about 30 years. 
they've now leveled off, but they've leveled off looking at the rate, like the rates for other adults. And in terms of the red flags for teenage suicide, I'll talk about those when I talk about the warning signs in a minute. Um, another question was also about statistics on the correlation between survivors of sexual assault and sexual abuse and suicide. There is a higher rate of suicide among people who have sexual abuse histories. And I think part of the reason for that is that nothing teaches you to disconnect or disassociate like sexual abuse. It primes a person to disconnect from themselves and their body, which makes suicide more possible. Sexual assault survivors also, that can be a precipitating factor for some, but it doesn't certainly happen to all people who've had that kind of history um, of either assault or abuse. Also, in terms of active duty suicide, another question was about combat trauma. Certainly what we're seeing with multiple deployments um, is that the most high risk group in the military, people who have multiple suicide attempts, have often had also multiple deployments. And you know, part of what is so traumatic um, about military involvement in terms of suicide risk is having been experienced a lot of loss that's often unresolved of uh, colleagues and comrades in battle, having seen a lot of uh, very traumatic and experienced a lot of trauma in terms of direct threat to your own life, um, but also having been involved and in engaging in behavior that's also traumatic to you. So even just participating um, in more is also traumatic for our soldiers. So I want to break down some basic misconceptions about suicide. And if you guys have further questions, please keep uh, putting them out there, and Gina will bring them in to me. So the first is that most suicides are caused by one particular triggering event. This is often the way it gets reported in the media. You know, uh, his wife died, so he killed himself, or he was a vet, so he killed himself. It takes a lot of bad things happening to somebody for them to become suicidal. Um, we had a young man that we lost in our community who was only 16 years old at the time of his death. But by the time he was 8 years old, his school counselor knew he was suicidal. It takes a person feeling pretty bad about themselves for a very long time. And then a triggering event, like the breakup of a relationship, or the threat of being arrested, or some other humiliating experience, will be the why now event. And when we want to prevent suicide, we do want to get a hold of the why now events. But we also have to look at all of the underlying pain um, that is now being culminated by this particular triggering event. Another idea is most suicides occur with little or no warning, so how can we prevent suicide? It turns out this just simply isn't true. 80 to 90 percent of adults and adolescents who take their lives have told somebody. Now, again, hindsight is 2020, so when we look back on it, we're like, oh, that's what they were communicating. But often, the people they tell, especially young people, they tell their friends, not a parent or a teacher, somebody who might be in a better position to help them. But most people do tell someone. And, you know, not always completely directly, but they usually do put it out there. But, you know, their friends and family and the people they're talking to think they can see all this person's good sides. They can see all the reasons this person has to live. They don't really think that their loved one, their family member, would do this. And so it's hard for them to really believe or react appropriately. But you know what? Most people do give us some warning. And we'll talk very specifically about the warning signs in a minute. Another idea is it's best to avoid the topic of suicide. If we don't talk about it, it won't happen. Well, we've been trying that strategy for a long time, and it isn't working. We need to talk about it. The more we can talk about it, the more we can destigmatize suicide and be able to discuss it and bring it up with people, the more we can all do to help prevent a suicide. And what I'm going to try to share with you today is not only the warning signs, but some basic helper tasks that anybody can do to help save a life. And if we do that, if we learn the CPR of suicide, if you will, can do a lot to prevent suicide in our country. It doesn't mean we can prevent all suicides, but we could prevent most. Another idea is that people who talk about suicide don't really do it. They're just trying to get our attention. Well, if 80 to 90 percent of people who are dying by suicide have told someone, the people who talk about it do do it. And we do need to take it seriously. And I would contend that we're much better off overreacting than underreacting. And if somebody is talking about suicide to get our attention, if we ignore them, in a way, what we're telling them is they have to do more to get our attention. And I don't think that's the message we want to send. Another idea is that people who make suicide attempts that, are, that don't end up dying by suicide are only trying to get our attention. 
especially if with adolescents, I hear more people say this, or children who talk about it. It just they're just trying to get their atten our attention, or they just saw something on TV. No, when young people are talking about this, when elderly people are talking about this, when anybody is talking about it, or when people are actually doing things to gamble with their own life and making attempts, we need to take it seriously. Because another thing that we found is that when people have made very non-lethal past attempts, they soon often escalate into much more lethal attempts. So we had a young 14-year-old girl in our community, and her first attempt was very not very lethal. Second attempt was also was a little more serious, but not very lethal, and she told her mom right away. The third attempt, she walked off a cliff, broke almost every bone in her body, and ended up with mild brain damage. We need to intervene early in this trajectory. We need to do what we can to get to people early in the cycle of becoming depressed or starting to act out on self-destructive behavior. Another idea is a suicidal person clearly wants to die, so why should we try to stop them? Um, our main proponent against putting up bridge barriers on a local bridge that had become a suicide hotspot in our community here in Santa Barbara um, kept saying that, you know, they'll just go somewhere else. Well, that's not true. People who are suicidal are ambivalent. Part of them wants to die, but another part of them wants to live. And just to stress this point, I'm going to give you the example of the 28 or so people who have survived their jump from the Golden Gate Bridge, one of whom you just heard John Kevin Hines talking. All of them say the minute they jumped, they wish they hadn't. Even people making this very lethal suicide attempt, over 99% lethal, are ambivalent. And the problem is once they make the attempt, they often want to live. They have this thought that they want to live. But the more lethal the means that they've used to attempt suicide, the more likely they are to lose their life. And the number one method of suicide in the United States is guns. And the problem with guns is that it takes one second of intent, and the person doesn't get any time to change their mind. We don't get any time to intervene in most cases. We want to try to reach out and connect with the part of the person that wants to live, and we want to do nothing to support the part that wants to die. There's still that real self somewhere in there. And if we can connect with that when somebody's in crisis, we can do a lot to prevent suicide. Another idea is that once a person attempts suicide, they'll never try it again. This is actually the opposite. Once a person attempts suicide, it gets easier to do again, and their lifetime risk goes up dramatically. Two or more attempts, and lifetime risk goes up astronomically. And what we find is that people with multiple attempts get triggered into a suicidal state at much lower levels of distress, and their attempts usually escalate in terms of the lethality or the likelihood that they'll die from them. So we need to pay attention to past attempts. Even just having a family history of suicide attempts makes somebody at higher risk. So that's another thing that you want to think about. Another idea, suicide is such a complex problem, what can I do about it? Well, people who are suicidal often do have complex problems. But it turns out that just being there for somebody can make the difference between life and death. There are a number of people who died by suicide off the Golden Gate Bridge who left notes saying, if one person smiles at me on the way to the bridge, I won't do it. Nobody smiled. Just smiling at people, reaching out, being willing to talk some, to somebody in public and ask them how they're doing can be life-saving. Okay, so it's very important to reach out to people. If you, I don't know how many of you have seen that commercial where a veteran comes back and he's at the airport picking up his luggage and nobody's there but him at the luggage uh, carousel. And then he's out on a big, busy New York street, but he's the only person there until one person comes up to him and shakes his hand and says, thank you for your service, and then all the people appear. Because that's how isolated a suicidal person feels. They feel isolated until one person is willing to connect with them. Kevin, who you saw on the tape, talks about walking back and forth on that bridge for 40 minutes, hoping one person would ask him what was wrong. He would tell them everything. The other thing is that with a suicidal person, we don't have to solve all their problems to make their life worth living. All we have to do is take move it from unbearable to just bearable. If we can make it just bearable, we can do a lot to save a life. Another idea is a person who has been depressed is suddenly feeling better. The danger of suicide is gone. This is when people get sent home from the hospital, right, or we stop worrying about them. What happens is that somebody who's been in a lot of psychological distress, if they're suddenly feeling better, it's often because they've come up with what they think is the perfect solution, which is suicide. They often feel elated because they found this solution to their psychological pain. So when somebody is suddenly feeling much better, we need to reassess for a suicide plan. We need to still consider them at risk. In fact, this may be 
more of a time that they're at risk. Another idea is that poor people are the source of most suicides. This is not true. Suicide happens a lot at, throughout the economic spectrum. The very wealthy and the very poor have slightly higher rates than people in the middle, but it cuts across the whole spectrum. When we had a young pe person die at one of our high schools recently who was part of a very poor population of our community, at the same time that we went to go do intervention in the high schools, there was the death of uh, the father of one of the wealthy students to suicide. So both of these things were going on in our community at the very same time. Another idea is that being religious protects against suicide. Now, if you're dealing with somebody who has the feeling of being drawn to suicide but they can't do it because it's a sin, you agree with them 100%. Now, I don't care what your personal beliefs are. You put those aside. But any reason that the person has for not doing it, you want to support. So if they really think it's a sin, that's great because that's protective for some people. If they can't do it because their cat needs them, that's great. You just want to make sure that cat sticks around. Whatever their reasons are for not doing it, we want to support. But just being born into a religion that considers suicide a sin is not protective. The person has to believe in the tenets of that religion. Now, these are the warning signs. Um, and if you go to uh, the PsychAlive YouTube channel, you can watch these. Um, when you get this link, you can watch them. Or if you go to PsychAlive, or you can see them. Um, I'm not going to play uh, our example because of time, but I am going to review the warning signs with you. So what are the warning signs? Disturbed sleep patterns. People who die by suicide have often not slept for weeks. They're either having trouble going to sleep or they're waking up in the middle of the night not being able to go back to sleep. Now when you haven't had sleep, you know you're more irritable. You're more reactive. You feel almost like you have a thinner skin, like everything impacts you more. It turns out that lack of sleep makes us more irritable and aggressive and aggressive toward ourselves. So when the person's not sleeping, that's something we need to pay attention to. Often, they're experiencing anxiety and agitation. It's not just depression. It's depression with agitation. The person is pacing back and forth, who is in that agitated state. Because what's going on for them is their stress hormones are raging out of control. Their stress axis, which is the HPA axis, is dysregulated. These are people with a lot of stress hormone or cortisol flowing in their system. That's at the time when they're going to be at high risk. So somebody who's, got, who's anxious is going to be at high risk. They're often pulling away from friends and family members. Now, everybody just often takes it personally. They just don't like me anymore. But that's because they're not communicating with everybody within that person's system. And if they really did, they would see that they're often pulling away from everybody. Again, if they've had past attempts, no matter how serious or not serious these past attempts were, we need to take this seriously. It turns out that 10% of people who died by suicide have been in the emergency department within the last two months of their life complaining about suicidal ideation and also having hurt themselves because they're engaging in risk-taking behavior. But if they have past attempts or there's a family history of past attempts, we need to consider their risk much, much higher. Often they're having extremely self-hating thoughts. They're making self-denigrating remarks. They're saying things like, you'll be better off when I'm gone or I'm such a burden. These are things we need to pay atten attention to. Now, they feel like they don't belong, like they don't fit in anywhere. That's not other people's perceptions. Their friends and family may feel like they very much do belong. But we have to look at things through the filter of how this person is seeing the world. And if they feel like they don't belong, like they don't fit in anywhere, they're going to be at much higher risk. If they're feeling hopeless, and it's not hopeless about the world situation or whatever. It's hope, personalized hopelessness. Nothing's ever going to get any better for me. If that feeling is there, you don't have to be depressed for very long. If you feel like things are never going to get any better, that's when you're likely to take your own life. They're often feeling a lot of rage. Rage at themselves, but also rage at other people. So they often are lashing out. And this is also part of how they're pushing people away. So if the person is raging at you, you also need to consider that they may be at risk for suicide. Often they're feeling trapped. Their thinking is very narrowed, and they don't feel like there's any way out of whatever their current predicament is. You may see that they have lots of options, but they're not seeing it that way. So they're feeling humiliated often and trapped in that humiliation, like it's never going to get any better. 
And often it's at transition points that people have trouble. Recently lost their job, recently widowed, recently divorced, recently incarcerated, um, having gone to jail, recently hospitalized. So it's in those recent times. People can learn to live with almost anything, and I think a really good example of this is Christopher Reeve. He went from being Superman, right, to being quadriplegic. And very shortly after his accident, he wanted to die. But his wife said to him, give me a year. If you still feel like doing it a year from now, I'll help you. But a year from now, he didn't feel like doing it anymore. People can learn to live again with almost anything, but when they feel like it first has happened, they're feeling trapped, they're feeling like there's no way out, they're feeling like they can't tolerate it. That's what they need help getting through. And partly what we want to teach people is what Christopher Reeve's wife taught him, which is to procrastinate suicide. If you can put it off, you're not very likely to feel like doing it later on. Often, again, there's increased use of alcohol or drugs. So it's not just long-term use, but increased use. That's going to put somebody at greater risk. And while alcohol is the number one drug in terms of suicide risk, others that are, with, are concerning are uh, cocaine and uh, methamphetamines. There are drugs that actually bring down suicide risk, um, like marijuana and heroin. While they're being used, they actually make it less likely. It's not that I'm advocating illegal drug use. I just wanted to make that point. The person is feeling like they're a burden to other people, like people will be better off without them. Um, David Jobes, a colleague of mine who's a suicidologist, recently did a study looking at the whole range of ambivalence in relation to suicide. And what he found is that people who have suicidal thoughts but are at the lower end, that are still feeling more drawn to life, feel like if they died by suicide, it would be uh, a stigma to their family, so they can't kill themselves. But people on the other end of the continuum who are feeling very drawn to death think, my family would be better off without me. I'm such a burden. So both of these thoughts are in relation to family, but you can see how they operate differently in terms of suicide risk. When people are concerned about stigmatizing their family, they're not very likely to do it. But when they're feeling like their family would actually be better off without them. Now, I've talked to lots of surviving family members. And to those of you in the audience who have lost a loved one to suicide, you know that family members never feel better off. It never works that way. But that's how the person is thinking. Again, this is the distorted filter through which they're seeing the world. And this perceived burdensomeness and this, quote, thwarted belongingness that we talked about, feeling like they don't belong anywhere, those are two factors that Thomas Joyner and his interpersonal model of suicide say have to be present for a person to die by suicide. They make up the desire for suicide. He also adds a third element that has to be present, which is they quote, acquired ability to take your own life. And acquired ability has to do with having had painful negative events happen to you. This is why soldiers are more at risk and vets. Uh, it's why people have had a lot of early uh, abuse experiences are more at risk. And I would contend that it has, to ability, has to do with the ability to disconnect from yourself. There's a loss of interest in favorite activities. Nothing matters anymore. Things the person used to love to do don't matter anymore. So with a young person, a young person has been very invested in being involved in a sport, and now they're not showing up for practice anymore. Or a young person who, you know, we don't have to worry so much when they don't want to get up to go to school, which they most may have always hated doing, but then when they don't want to get out of bed to go out with their friends to do an activity they used to love to do, that's when we should get concerned. With adults, when a person who's very much cared about their appearance comes to work looking disheveled, um, or a person who's been very invested in their career is now missing lots of days at work, um, again, these are risk factors or things that we need to look at. The person is giving up on themselves. They're feeling like they don't matter anymore, nothing matters. They're disconnecting from themselves, which set the stage for doing this very aggressive act against themselves, um, make it possible. They're often engaging in a lot of risk-taking behavior, driving too quickly, driving under the influence, uh, putting themselves in dangerous situations where they're almost baiting other people to take them, their life. So this is another way that they're um, sort of tempting fate in terms of suicide. If they're having thoughts about suicide, making plans of how to take their life, and actually taking actions to procure the means for suicide, the farther they are along this path, the higher the risk. So the more intensity of thoughts, the more specific the thoughts, the shorter the time frame of the plan, the more lethal the method that's planned, the higher the risk. 
if they've actually taken action so that they easily have on hand the method for suicide, they're at higher risk. And anything you can do to put diff time between the person and their suicide plan can help save a life. So one of the things that they've done in England is they've made medications, over-counter medications that are lethal and overdose, so you can only buy them in small bottles. Because what they found is that people spontaneously take what's in the kitchen cabinet. Now you can still go to 10 different stores and get 10 different small bottles, but that's not what people did. And when they did this in England, not only did the suicide rate go down, but so did the need for liver transplants, which is what happens um, with an overdose of this medication. Um, if the person doesn't die by suicide, they often need a liver transplant. So, you know, whenever we put distance between a person and their plan, we can help save a life. If you'd like to know more about this, go to the website Means Matter. This is the Harvard uh, School of Public Health website. And if you just Google Means Matter, it will come up and I'll talk to you about means restriction. And it is part of our new national strategy that just came out on September 10th, is means restriction. Another learning sign is sudden moon changes for the better. Again, if the person is suddenly feeling better, suddenly spending all the money they made all summer trying to save for college, suddenly having lots of parties with their friends when they've been feeling really badly, we have to get concerned. So what are some protective factors? Family and community connections and support. The more that we can make the person feel that they matter to their family, to their community, to others, and we can provide that support. Again, that's why reaching out and just going up and being willing to talk to somebody we see crying in a public place. Now, half the time they may blow you off and say, you know, leave me alone. Fine, leave them alone. But another half of the time they're just waiting for somebody to say something. When clinical care is available and accessible, and one of the things we find in our community is the people who need care most don't know how to access it. And that's why we try to put on public forums and, you know, make people aware at every turn. It's one of the things we can do by reporting about it or writing about it. We need to make clinical care available and accessible to people who need it. Some people are just more resilient than others. Some people can bounce back more. Some people see stressors or negative life events as challenges to overcome. And they feel a locus of control within themselves, like they can make it happen. And they feel like they have the capability. Other people are not as resilient. And it turns out that the more adverse childhood events that you've had, the more difficulty you're going to have around resilience. But the more we can train resilience in something that's called hardiness that we wrote about in a blog recently, um, and that's something we found can be trained. There's resilience training and hardiness training that are available. And if you'd like to find out about them, feel free to contact us, and we'll help uh, link you to those links. But if we can build hardiness and resilience, we can reduce suicide risk, and it's one of the things the U.S. military is trying to do right now to help deal with its suicide problem, among many others that they are funding and implementing. The more coping skills a person has, the less at risk for suicide they are going to be. So helping teach the person coping skills is really important. But also how to use those coping skills when they're in a suicidal state. Because often we need what we really need is state-dependent learning, that when you're in that state, how can you use the skills? And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. We also, it depends how much frustration, tolerance, and emotional regulation skills the person has. So what do we mean by this? Some people can be frustrated or feel really badly and just sit with that feeling. Those are not people who are very likely to take their own life. It's people who don't have much tolerance for negative emotions. And these are strong, very negative emotions that drive suicide. That when people can learn to tolerate those feelings better or to be able to sit with them better, they're not very likely to take their life. Also, we can, they can learn good, healthy coping skills for calming their emotions down. We need good skills for being able to bring ourselves back to feeling okay if we're going to help prevent suicide. And when the person has cultural or religious or spiritual beliefs that give their life meaning or engage in activities that give their life meaning, they're not very likely to take their life. So anything we can do to increase their connectedness to cultural, religious, or spiritual beliefs or things that give their life meaning the more we can do to protect against suicide. And this, again, is Thomas Joyner's model. So we have to have the, and this is what our national lifeline is run on. When they call, people call to our national lifeline, which I'll, remember I'll share with you at the end, they are looking for, is there a feeling that they are a burden to other people? Are they feeling like they don't belong? And do they have this acquired capability? Have they had life experiences 
that make it possible for them. And this is direct experiences, and it's also um, indirect experiences. So let me give you an example from the two groups of women with the highest suicide rates in the United States are prostitutes, women who have often had a lot of trauma in their life directly, and women doctors who've had a lot of vicarious trauma. So how does suicide occur? There's underlying vulnerabilities, like having a mood disorder, a substance abuse problem, having issues around aggression or anxiety or impulsivity. And people who are more impulsive are more likely to act when they're 51% on the wrong side of themselves. In terms of sexual orientation, this has to do with discrimination issues, that when a person has had more victimization experiences or not being accepted for the sexual orientation that they are, they're going to be at higher risk for suicide. Having abnormal serotonin levels, this has to do with having genetic vulnerability for depression and impulsivity and suicidality when you have low serotonin levels. And this is why some of the antidepressants that help raise serotonin levels in our bloodstream are at the receptor sites so that we are getting more serotonin activating our brain um, can reduce suicide risk potentially. Family characteristics. There are some families where there's been history of suicide, history of depression that are going to, that's going to contribute to risk. Or where there's been more adverse childhood events, um, more physical, sexual abuse, more neglect, uh, more moves, more separations, more loss of a parent. Um, if there's been a history of prior suicidality, sexual abuse, physical abuse, and social adversity. So these all contribute to underlying vulnerability or risk for suicide. But then there's a stressful event. That's the why now, if you will. That it, sometimes these stressful events, by the way, are caused by these underlying characteristics. So you have a substance abuse disorder, which leads to then the stressful event of a breakup of a relationship or the loss of a job. Okay? So these underlying things sometimes contribute to the stressful event, um, like getting in trouble with the law or having a loss. And we also now know that being bullied is one of these stressful events that can be a precipitator for somebody who has underlying vulnerability for a suicide. These lead to acute mood changes, anxiety, dread, hopelessness, and anger. These very strong negative emotions are stirred up by this underlying vulnerability in combination with the now stressful event. And then it leads to things that can inhibit a suicide risk and things that can facilitate it. So what are the things that inhibit suicide risk? Family cohesion, being in a close-knit family, living closely with other people, religiosity or spirituality or having meaning in your life, having available support, friends, family members, mental health support. And the Internet can be helpful and can be inhibiting because there are many websites that have resources for people who are suicidal that can be accessed on the Internet. What are the things that, on the other hand, can facilitate a person who's got this underlying vulnerability, now a stressful event, and these acute mood changes that can contribute to suicide? Having a method or weapon available really drastically increases the likelihood that a suicide is going to occur. Having had a recent example, that means having another young person at the same high school die by suicide. Having somebody in your community that you know about who is prominent, who is respected, die by suicide. And how the media displays this can be facilitating as well. If it is romanticized in any way in the media, you know, showing a picture, showing everybody crying around the grave of somebody who's died by suicide, gives the message that, oh, if I die by suicide, it will get everybody's attention. And unfortunately, there are sites on the internet that promote suicide or encourage suicidal behavior that talk about methods or how to do it and that so forth. And those can actually help facilitate it. So the internet weighs in on both sides of this. Okay? And this can mean the difference between su survival and suicide. So here's some examples of narratives of people who died by suicide. I can't stand being so depressed anymore. I, can't, I can stop this pain by killing myself. I'm damaged goods. Suicide is the only choice I have. And often, again, there's this constricted thinking. They don't feel like they have another option. My family would be better off without me. I was just a lifeless thing, breathing but worthless. I knew everyone would be better off if I were dead. 
It would end my misery and relieve their burden. My death will be worth more than my life to my family. Now, this is not how family members feel, but this is often how the suicidal person is thinking. I'm useless and unwanted. No one cares whether I live or die. They're feeling rejected and marginalized, even though, again, this is now how other people are seeing them. I'm worthless and don't deserve to live. I have an enemy within that I have to escape. There's a feeling of having to escape from this very negative self or trying to kill a part of themselves. But as my colleague Isri Orbach says in a clip that we have of him, there's no way to kill a part of yourself. I'm in a tailspin, like a freight chain or a tsunami hit me. There's no hope. I can't get cut up. What's the point? Again, this feeling trapped, like there's no way out. I hate myself. I can't fix this problem. I should just die. That's that tunnel vision. I'd rather die than feel this way. They don't have the tolerance to sit with these negative feelings. I've lost everything that's important to me. My future looks empty. Life is no longer worth living. Nothing will change. There's no hope for me. Again, this perceived hopelessness. I've screwed up, so I might as well screw up all the way. Those who hurt me will be sorry. Now, there's some people where their su suicides do have a vindictive element of getting back at people or letting people know how much they're hurting. And these people can be at great risk as well. It used to, we used to think there was people who were manipulative around suicide and then there was people who were really serious. It turns out that some people who are vindictive and manipulative around suicide are also very likely to lose their lives. Suicide is a way of life for me. I can't stop it. And some people feel like that, almost like they're addicted to the suicidal process, to thinking about suicide gives them relief. Now, I'm not going to show this clip, but if you would like to watch it later, um, I think it's a very important one in that it illustrates the ambivalence in suicide. And one of the things that suicidal people often do is they put suicide out there, they say something to somebody about it, but then they kind of take it back. And then they kind of go back and forth. Um, so you know, once a person picks up on it and says, really, are, are you thinking about doing it? Oh, no, 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 I wasn't serious. Or a young person that we had in our community would say to his friends, things, well, maybe I should just kill myself. And his friends would say, really, are you going to kill yourself? And he'd say, what, are you telling me to do it? Well, that got them to, to back off and to shut up, right? Um, and they would back away. And you know, they saw all of his good traits. They didn't think he would ever really do this. Unfortunately, he did. So if you think about this self and this anti-self, when a person is giving in to these critical inner voices, when they're letting them take reign over them and direct their behavior, those negative thoughts are taking more and more hold over their behavior. This is something that some people have called the suicidal trance. Cognitive behavioral therapists sometimes call it the suicidal mode. Um, there's this way of thinking that gets stronger and stronger as the person gives into this way of thinking and starts to direct their life based on this way of thinking. But what we're going to try to do in a time of crisis is we're going to try to get the person to act on their own self, to connect with the part of them that wants to live, to strengthen their real self so that these negative thoughts will fade into the background. Now, that doesn't mean they'll go away altogether or the person will never have them. That just means like Max in the Wild Things when he stands up to the monsters and they're saying, don't go, we love you so, we'll eat you up. He says, no, I'm going to go. And... Um, I like this example of this monster that lives inside of us because um, Maurice Sendak actually modeled the monsters for where the wild things are after his relatives that would come over and actually scared him <laughs> as a child, partly because they would say things like, we'll eat you up, we love you so. So um, I just wanted to touch on the uh, different risk factors for suicide. In terms of psychiatric disorders, and we now know that something over 90% of people who die by suicide have some kind of diagnosable psychiatric disorder that could have been treated, potentially. And the number one uh, psychiatric disorders that are associated with suicide risk are major depression and bipolar disorder. Mood disorders have the highest risk of suicide. But again, early in the onset of the disorder, the risk is much higher. People learn to live with these if they're recurring conditions, but it's in the beginning of the disorder that they get much more suicidal. Now, that may be a first episode of major depression at age 80. It's not that um, it's first episode whenever it occurs. It's going to be the highest risk time in the first few episodes of major depressive disorder or bipolar disorder. Alcohol dependence we talked about earlier. Drug addiction people have a higher risk of suicide. They also lead more dangerous lifestyles and get themselves killed by other people more often. Personality disorders, particularly having a lack of sense of identity and a 
difficulty regulating emotion and tolerating emotion, which are common characteristics of people who experience something called borderline personality disorder. And when you have more than one of these going on, like you have depression, but you also have an alcohol problem and maybe an underlying personality disorder, things get much worse. People with schizophrenia have higher risk, and they have higher risk at two times. One is in a very active phase of their illness, when they're experiencing command hallucinations to do things like to kill themselves. But also, in a non-active phase of their illness, people with schizophrenia who take a medication that makes them much clearer than they've been in years are sometimes at much higher risk at that time because they get depressed about the ongoing nature of their disorder. Past history, um, we talked about family history and possible biological markers we talked about. And people in poor physical health also have higher risk of suicide. People with a recent loss, particularly who have unresolved loss, having lost a parent in their childhood, the anniversary of the time a year ago when a loved one died. These are not the, you know, more people kill themselves not at Christmas or New Year's. It's actually in the spring, but on personal anniversaries or holidays. Having an unstable family situation and particularly losing social supports, recently widowed, recently divorced. Social factors, we talked a little bit about males have a higher suicide rate than females, and that's true in every country, including ours. And in our country, the two highest groups for suicide in the United States are people who are white and Native American groups. Um, and this is true uh, of Native American groups uh, in Canada uh, and Alaska as well. With age, men rates just rise with age. With women, they peak at about age 55 and start to decline. What we've seen during the recent economic crisis is a rise in suicide for working age people. And again, religion. Um, we talked a little bit about. I'm not going to go into all of these. Uh, we do have a higher suicide rate in urban areas than in rural areas. People who are divorced, single, or widowed have higher rates than people who are married. And again, there's slightly higher ends of both of the spectrum. Um, I'm not going to uh, go into this right now, but I'm, it's a question that I want you to think about. Have you ever had anybody confide in you about suicidal thoughts? Um, and uh, these are helper tasks that are illustrated in this film, and I want to go over these with you now because we're running out of time for the webinar, and I think they're really important. The first thing is, if you're worried about somebody's suicide risk, be willing to engage with them. Again, this is whether it's a person that you see on the street, your grandparent, your child, your coworker, your spouse. Engage with the person at risk in a personable way. Use eye contact and give them your full attention. This is not a time to let yourself get distracted. Make eye contact. Lean forward. Show them with your body language that you care. Explore the current situation with them from their point of view. How do they see it? So if it's a young person who's ready to kill themselves because they've gotten their first day minus, that may seem like no big deal to you, but try and see it through their eyes. For many people, if they're not perfect, they're nothing. Encourage the open expression of their personal concerns and their emotions. The more they can vent about their feelings, their pain, their sadness, their anger, their rage, the less likely they are to have to end their own lives. Identify whether or not the person is currently thinking about suicide. Be willing to ask them directly. Have you ever thought about suicide? Have you ever thought about hurting yourself? If their answer doesn't sit right with you, be willing to ask again. Inquire. If the person is indeed contemplating suicide, why now? What is going on at this moment in time which is triggering it? Not the thing that happened two years ago, but the right now. Also answer where, when, and how are they thinking about doing it. The more specific questions you ask, the more likely you are to get real answers. It's harder to deny a specific behavior than a general. Um, and also, though, look for what are the person's strengths. What is the part of them that still wants to live, and how can you connect with that part? What are their strengths? What are the things that still can it keep them connected into life? What are the things that still light them up? What are the things they know how to do that help calm them down? Any way you can connect with that part of them can help save a life. Then you want to develop an action plan with them. What are you going to do, and what are they going to do to help save their life? The more you're committing to things as well, the more they're going to feel commit, cared about. And you want to limit your objectives. You're not going to try to solve all their plans with this, pro with this plan, this action plan. You're going to try to help get them to help. Okay? So what's the next step to getting them to help? And again, you're working together with the person. And you want to do your half of the agreement. 
at the end of making this plan for their safety, you want to get their commitment to it. You want to make sure that they can say out loud what it is that they're going to do. I'm going to meet you tomorrow morning at the counselor's office, and we're going to walk in together, or I'm going to walk with you over to the hospital right now if you don't feel like they're safe. And if between now and when you're going to carry out the next step in your plan, they get overwhelmed with suicidal feelings, what can they do? How can they get a hold of you? And you want to make sure they have the 1-800-273-TALK number. That is our national lifeline. And when they call that number, it'll say press 1 if you're a veteran or an active duty military personnel or the family person thereof or friend thereof. And if you press that, you get access to the Veterans Helpline, which can connect you to all the resources for active duty and military personnel. And spell out the follow-up. What are you going to do next, and when are you going to get together again? I'm not going to do this last poll, too. But I want to suggest these coping suggestions for a suicidal person and a safety plan. Now I'm going to go through this really quickly because we're out of time. And I didn't get a chance to answer the rest of your questions, but I will do that in the next coming days. But this is also available on our website, PsychAlive. So these are things you can do if you're the person who's at risk. Recognize what are the specific actions that you notice that let you know that you're starting to feel bad, that you're getting into suicidal crisis. So what are the things that show you that you're getting into a suicidal state? What are your personalized risk factors? Write those down. When you stop sleeping, when you start pulling away from friends, when you stop writing or painting or whatever it is, or you start isolating yourselves. So you know what your personal risk signs are. What activities can you engage in that make, yourself, make you feel better? It could be taking a walk, playing with your dog, baking brownies, meditating, watching a funny movie that makes you laugh, listening to music from a good time in your life. Music is very mood-inducing. Make sure it's music from a happy time in your life. Um, a card that when you give it to you, your loved one, they know they re you really need their attention right now. Um, what are things you can do that make you feel better? taking a hot shower, taking a cold bath. One of the things that Kevin does now is he puts on his shoes and he goes for a run. Now he has a dog. He takes his dog with him and runs with him, and that makes him feel better. Where could you go to be with other people that would help distract you from your suicidal thoughts? Going to the mall, going to a coffee shop, going to a, an athletic event. Where can you go to be around people that will help take your mind off suicide? Or who can you call? Is there a friend you can call that when you're talking to them, you just don't think about it? These are people you like or make you feel better. But also, who could you call to talk about suicide with? Is there somebody in your immediate social circle, a friend, a family member, uh, a minister, a school counselor, that would help you when you're feeling suicidal? And also, how can you get the lethal means of suicide out of your house? Make it more difficult for you to take your life when you're in crisis. And finally, make sure that you have this number at all times, this 1-800-273-TALK. Put it in your phone. Make it easy for you to access. And they are going to make, by the way, this safety plan a, an app that you can have on um, any smartphone very soon. Our US military is working to do that. They're also doing that for this Quotes Hope Kit. And this is something suicidal people can do, and you can do with a person who's suicidal, is create a box where they put in it things that are going to help remind them at the time that they're feeling suicidal that they don't really want to do this. Photographs of their loved ones, letters from their loved ones, souvenirs, things that have particular meaning for them. Um, again, a card maybe that when you give it to your spouse, they know they need to listen to you right now. Your favorite music that makes you always feel better. Again, that funny movie you can watch. Whatever it is that helps make you feel better. This is another uh, app that has already been developed that's available. Um, it's called Ask, and it walks you through the signs of how to ask somebody about suicide and the things you can do. And it has the suicide hotline number on it. I think it's important to remember this uh, from the work of Dan Siegel in the forefront of a field he calls interpersonal neurobiology, that it's always important to have a cool attitude towards yourself, curious, open, accepting, and loving that no other attitude is really appropriate toward yourself. Even if you've engaged in behavior you don't like, be curious about it, be open, be accepting, and be loving toward yourself. So here's the do's and don'ts of suicide prevention. Be aware. Learn the warning signs. Get involved. Become available. Show interest and support. Ask the person if they're thinking about suicide. Don't be afraid to talk about it. Be direct. Talk openly and freely about suicide. Be willing to listen. 
and allow the expression of feelings. Accept the feelings. Don't try to talk the person out of their feelings. Be non-judgmental. Don't debate whether suicide is right or wrong or the feelings are good or bad. Don't lecture on the value of life. Offer hope that alternatives are available and take action. Here's the don'ts. Don't dare the person to do it. Now that may seem obvious, but sometimes suicide people, suicidal people provoke people who care about them into daring them to do it. Don't get caught in that. Don't ask why. Why do you feel like killing yourself? This just encourages defensiveness. We're not very good at why questions. Why do you do this? Why do you do that? It just tends to make us shut up. Offer empathy for the feelings, but not sympathy for the solution. Offer empathy with their feelings and feeling so overwhelmed, but not sympathy with the solution of suicide. Don't act shocked if they talk about suicide. That'll just put distance between you and the person who may take their own life. Don't be sworn to secrecy. Don't let your friends say, don't tell anybody. Seek support. Reach out. Talk to somebody. You can call the National Lifeline. They'll help talk you through it if you're trying to help a friend. Reach out to somebody, an adult, if you're a teenager and your friend tells you this. You can't afford to friendly keep your friend's secret. You can't afford to let them die. Take it seriously. Talk to your parent or their parent or that teacher at school you really like or anybody that you think can help you help this person. And I'm not going to uh, ask this last poll, but I do know that many of you have been impacted by the loss of somebody to suicide. When we lose somebody to suicide, these are the common emotions that we experience. There's a shock, like at any sudden death, guilt, despair, stress, rejection. We feel like the person is choosing to leave, leave us, even though they're not doing it in a clear-headed mindset. Remember that. Confusion, helplessness, denial, anger. We do feel angry at the person who did it, and that's confusing. And we tend to want to blame somebody, whether that be ourselves, if I'd only done this, if I'd only done that, or whether it be somebody else. It doesn't really help to blame anybody, and nobody is really responsible except the person who died, and that's the most painful thing, is to blame the person who's now lost their life. Disbelief, sadness, loneliness, self-blame, depression, pain, shame, hopelessness, numbness, abandonment, and anxiety. There are a whole range of emotions, and it's important to let ourselves experience them. These are normal reactions, and it's important to get help or seek help for them. So what can we do to take care of ourselves? Ask for help. Talk to other people. Get plenty of rest. I usually fail at this one, but it's a good one. Drink plenty of water. I'm better at that one. Do not use alcohol or drugs to cover your stress. That's just going to make things worse in the long run. Exercise. Things that we do that help raise our endorphins in our brain are good for us. And the side effect, well, we might get a little more fit. Not a bad side effect. Use relaxation skills, things that help calm you down. And go to our website, psychalive.org, to get our suicide advice page. We'll help give you a lot of information. There's also the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention that just came out with our new national strategy. And when you get the slides, you can directly link to these. The American Association for Suicidology can show you about survivor support group and also lots of good information about suicide and suicide prevention. And internationally, on the International Suicide Survivors Organization, or the International Association of Suicide Prevention can link you to resources all over the world and survivor groups for loved ones who've lost a family member for suicide in all different countries throughout the world. Um, for help in an immediate crisis, if someone's threatening to kill or hurt themselves or is looking for ways to kill themselves, call 911. Seek immediate help. If someone you care about, if you see signs of hopelessness, rage, acting recklessly, feeling trapped, Thoughts on talking or writing about death or dying by suicide, increase of alcohol and drugs use, withdrawal from friends and family, anxiety and agitation, dramatic mood changes, saying there's no reason for them to live. Seek help by consulting a mental health professional or calling the National Lifeline. They will help walk you through it. 1-800-273-TALK. These are our resources for suicide prevention. This is our book for professionals, Suicide in the Inner Voice and our book, Conquer Your Critical Inner Voice, which has a lot of exercises for getting at this critical inner voice that we all have. Here's our films about suicide. Understanding and Preventing Suicide is our film to educate the general public. Voices of Suicide is our training video for professionals. And Phases of Suicide is our film for survivors, people who have lost loved ones to suicide. These are the measures we've uh, developed for assessing risk. And we do have um, a test that professionals can use to help assess suicide risk, the Firestone Assessment of Self-Destructive 
thoughts and the FASI, the Fire Sun Assessment of Suicide Intent. These are our upcoming webinars. We have an upcoming webinars that are uh, CE for professionals. One is on complex forms of post-traumatic stress disorder with Christine Courtois as our guest. We're doing one for professionals on suicide, what every health professional needs to know, coming up on September 25th. And one on understanding and effectively treating violent individuals with James Gilligan as our guest in October. For the general public, we have an upcoming webinar on how violence occurs and how we can prevent it with James Gilligan and also an upcoming webinar on how to raise an emotionally healthy child. To learn more or register, come to our website, Psych Alive, and to contact me and for more information and to further answer your questions, please go to the Glennon Association website or the Psych Alive website. And this is our toll-free number. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm sorry we've run out of time, but I'm going to end the webinar here. And again, feel free to contact us if you have more questions. And thank you all for attending today. Goodbye.